So today's artist has uh, something of an adversarial relationship with one of her biggest hits, the top 10 hit that broke her career wide open. There's a few reasons for this, but ultimately, even though she made it famous, it wasn't her song to begin with. That distinction goes to a struggling songwriter who wrote it after punching pillows in a new age therapy session. Yeah, you can't make this stuff up. But whether or not today's artist even likes this song anymore, there's no doubt that generations of fans haven't been able to get enough of it. I mean, it's a classic rock radio staple for sure. It's always on the radio. It oozes confidence and bravado. Plus it's sung by an 80s firecracker front woman, but she's actually vowed never to sing it again. Never again. Find out why coming up next on Professor Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever owned a pair of x-ray glasses, you know, that you bought out of the back of a comic book that took months to get in the mail, and then you were totally disappointed, you're going to dig this channel in nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now so you always know when our latest videos come up. Click the bell, all that goodness. Uh, we also have a Patreon. You're going to want to check that out. Full interviews, other exclusive content there helps us support the channel. So it's time for another edition of our show, Number One in Our Hearts. This is a show that honors songs that were so great, they should have been number one on the Billboard Hot 100. But for whatever reason, be it radio play, lack of marketing, label support, or like I said in the past, sheer stupidity, they came up short. Previous episodes we've covered Under Pressure by Queen and David Bowie, uh, Baker Street by Jerry Rafferty, and Lunatic Fringe by Red Ryder. Today, we're going to tell the story of the top 10 rock smash, Hit Me With Your Best Shot. Coming from Pat Benatar's 1980 sophomore LP, Crimes of Passion. Pat Benatar was actually born Patricia Andrzejewski on uh, January 10th, 1953 in Brooklyn, New York. She grew up on the wrong side of the tracks in Lindenhurst on Long Island, New York. Something that definitely influenced her image later on as a recording artist. Pat's mother was actually a former opera singer and took the opportunity to train Pat in the art of opera singing growing up. Definitely tell. However, by the time she was a teen, Pat Benatar discovered rock and roll. She became a fan of bands like Led Zeppelin. And, you know, she started to drift away from her operatic uh, upbringing. Pat soon turned her attention to bands like the Beatles and the Stones and, and Motown and R&B. At age 19, Pat married her high school boyfriend, Dennis Benatar. Uh, after he was drafted into the Army, the couple relocated to Virginia, where Pat worked any music-related job that she could find. Uh, this included a gig as a singing waitress in a Roaring Twenties restaurant. She sang everything from cabaret and R&B to contemporary songs and everywhere from nightclubs to hotel lounges. Yeah, she also went from being a secretary to selling out arenas. She definitely paid her dues. In 1975, the couple moved back to New York, but their marriage was failing. Pat soon filed for divorce, but she kept the last name Benatar for her professional persona. On her own, she took whatever singing job she could just to pay the bills. Pat got her big break in 1977 at a Manhattan club called Catch a Rising Star. There on open mic nights, Pat took the stage around 3 a.m. By that point, the crowd was hardly paying attention to the performers. That is until Pat Benatar started singing. The song was Judy Garland's Rockabye Your Baby with a Dixie melody. Your baby with a Dixie. Said Pat Benatar about it. Everybody just went crazy. I didn't do anything spectacular. It was just one of those magical things. But afterwards, club owner Rick Newman approached Pat about performing at the club on a regular basis. And soon after that, he became Pat Benatar's first manager. Over the next year, the buzz around Pat continued to grow. Jeff Aldrich from Chrysalis Records made the trip to the Rising Star, and he really liked what he saw and heard. He signed Pat on the spot. In no time, Pat Benatar was in L.A. recording with producer Mike Chapman. 
Yeah, he actually wasn't taking on any new artists at that time. However, when he heard Pat sing, he made an exception. Pretty much from the start, Chapman recommended she work with Derringer guitarist Neil Giraldo, AKA Spider, with a Y, of course. When Giraldo walked into the studio, it was actually love at first sight. Pat later called up her friend and told her she'd met the father of my children. The two would ultimately marry in 1982, and they continue to work together ever after, to this day. Pat's first studio album, In the Heat of the Night, that was released on August 27, 1979. The record would reach number 12 on the Billboard charts and sell more than a million copies in the U.S. And that was uh, a lot due to her first top 40 hit, Heartbreaker. Now, at Chrysalis, everyone realized that Benatar was a rock star in the making. Her opera training gave her voice uh, the stamina to take on the biggest rock numbers. On stage, Pat Benatar was a firecracker. Dressed in leotards, spandex tights, and high heels, she kicked and punched her way through her shows. <laughs> Said Pat about it. A lot of women singers today seem to be saying, if you love me, and then hurt me, I'll die. I say, if you love me, then hurt me, I'll kick your ass. That's what she said. Pat's onstage persona, it drove audiences wild, especially the guys, you know, which Chrysalis was quick to pick up on. From the get-go, they pushed the, the sexy rocker with a kick-butt persona, raking in millions of records sold in the process. However, as Pat's first album climbed the charts, she rebelled. She got rid of the tights. She put on a jacket, cut her hair short. Another thing, she also insisted a clause be written into her contract stating that no photos could be issued without her approval. But it didn't matter how much she fought against this image, the music industry was determined to make Pat Benatar a sex symbol, even after she was married. And the record buying public, they ate it up. Said Pat Benatar about it, I never thought of myself as sexy. I never thought about a period, never. Growing up, I was skinny and flat chested with big teeth and thin, straight hair. Sexy didn't even occur to me. I dressed the way I did because I liked it, not because I thought men liked it. I was much more interested in showing how strong-minded I was. It was all about not taking crap from anyone for any reason. I wanted the stereotypes to disappear. I didn't want to be a female rocker. I just wanted to be a rocker. End of quote. Now, as we continue to break down this classic song, I do want to thank our awesome sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the brand of glasses you see right here on my face that I always wear. If you want a crazy variety of choices, the best price, the best customer service in the industry, and total convenience, click on the link here. It's up here somewhere or in our description to order your new favorite pair of glasses, starting at just $6.95. Do it today and tell them we sent you. You're gonna love it. Another point of contention between Benatar and her label was her insistence that she wasn't a one-woman show. Because Chrysalis was so adamant about promoting her as a sex symbol, they didn't want to draw any attention to the fact that there was a creative team of artists contributing to the music. But for Pat Benatar, it was never just about her. For Crimes of Passion, the rest of the band included Scott St. Clair Sheets on guitar, Roger Capps on bass and backing vocals, Myron Grombacher on drums, and of course, Benatar's soon-to-be husband, Neil Spider Geraldo on lead and rhythm guitars, keyboards, and also on backing vocals. Crimes of Passion was produced by Keith Olsen. But according to Pat Benatar, who goes into this in great detail in her book, Between a Heart and a Rock Place, great book, you need to read it, Olsen was producer, really a name only. Pat Benatar would say that Keith Olsen, as good a guy as he was, was distracted by personal issues at the time, and Pat was on the verge of breaking down trying to, to work with him. He may have been there in the studio, but it was actually Neil Giraldo who did most of the production work an effort the label would thank him for by leaving his name off of the production credits. However, to give them credit, they officially hired him as a co-producer for Pat's next album, Precious Time. Crimes of Passion was a commercial and critical hit that went gold in less than two weeks 
and to tally more than 4 million sales in the U.S. Incredible. The LP reached number two on the charts and it delivered Pat Benatar the first of four consecutive Grammys for best female rock vocal performance. Crimes of Passion, often considered the best album of her career, uh, helped solidify her as one of the foremost rockers of the 80s and one of the most iconic artists of that time as well, female or male. The songs in the album were just as hard hitting as she was, and the public ate it up. Singles included You Better Run, of course, a Rascals cover, and actually the second video that MTV ever played. You run, you hide. Also, there was Treat Me Right, and today's featured song, Hit Me With Your Best Shot. Hit Me With Your Best Shot is, of course, one of the biggest songs of Pat Benatar's career, if not the biggest. I mean, a couple of others like uh, Love Is A Battlefield would score higher on the charts. Love is a battlefield. Are also just as iconic, but I gotta tell you, it's just something about Hit Me With Your Best Shot. Just such a hard hitting song. That's okay, see if I can. However, keeping track here, Pat Benatar was not the author of the song. That distinction goes to Canadian songwriter, artist, producer, Eddie Schwartz. And the fact that Pat Benatar would not be a part of the song's creation, at least not in its original version, um, that, uh, well, that would complicate things between her and Hit Me later down the road. I'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, Hit Me With Your Best Shot would actually take the longest to write out of any of Eddie Schwartz's songs. There's a really a couple of good stories that go along with how he wrote it. I guess the idea came to him when he was at a really low point in his life, feeling desperate and defeated. He took a friend up on a suggestion to try out some new age therapy techniques. One of the things he did in therapy was punch pillows, actually. While doing this, he was supposed to verbalize the frustrations, whatever they were. I guess it was supposed to be a safe way to get some aggression out for him. After finishing up with the second or third New Age pillow fight, Eddie went outside and while standing on the porch, he had this epiphany and the words, hit me with your best shot, came into his mind. Eddie remembers getting really excited and thinking that he was onto something here. This would make an amazing song. So after working on it for a while, he booked some studio time after playing a show. Uh, it was about 3 a.m. when he got there. But even though he'd been working on it, at that point, all he had was the chorus and really some of the hooks. But he didn't have the verses. So I guess by 6 in the morning, everyone had given up on the song and just gone home. Everyone except for Eddie and the engineer. The session was all but over. Um, said Eddie about this, I stepped up to the microphone and I realized I had no verse lyrics. And I said, look, just run the tape three times. Whatever I sing the third time, those are going to be the lyrics. We'll just go with whatever that is. And I really just improvised the lyrics. Each of the first two times as I sang, if anything came out of my mouth that I liked, I jotted it down. And lo and behold, by the time he pressed record on that third pass, the song was written as we basically know it. The only difference was that it was written from a male standpoint. Like Eventually, Eddie would sign with a company named ATV in LA and Hit Me With Your Best Shot was a song that he was most excited about recording. Unfortunately, they despised this song. Uh, it took months for Eddie to convince them to demo the song, and they finally did. But they hated the end product so much that they actually erased the master recordings of this song. Deleted, gone. Uh, completely dejected, Eddie, he bought a plane ticket to fly back home to Toronto. However, before he left, one of the engineers handed him a cassette and said, you know, they told me you erased the song. And I had to, because they're one of my biggest clients, but I made one cassette. I made one copy of this song uh, before because I knew how much you loved the song. So here it is. They gave it to him. Eventually, this nearly erased song made its way to Chrysalis and into Pat Benatar's hands. 
As the story goes here, Pat was in a meeting when she heard the song playing through the wall. Uh, publisher Marv Goodman, who was listening to the song over and over, uh, Pat heard it, she got really excited, and she wanted to record it. Said Pat about it, back then we looked to outside writers to provide the hits. It was my job to sift through the box loads of song demos submitted by songwriters. I guess in this case, she did have one less demo tape to sift through because she heard it. Now, lyrically, uh, some have called this song sexually suggestive. And at the time of its release, there was also, you know, commentary from newspapers about the song being sexist and advocating violence against women. Uh, this is one thing that really perplexed Eddie Schwartz, the writer, especially since he originally wrote it from a man's standpoint. Plus, anyone who's paid any attention to the context of the song knows that any punches thrown are purely metaphorical, really. Let's get down to it. As for the meaning, Eddie Schwartz, who wrote it, he knows, he dismissed the idea that the song was about sex. Rather, he said, I sort of think the song is laden with sexual innuendo, but I think at the core of the song, it's a song about self-confidence. It's a song saying, no matter what you throw at me, I can handle it. I can play in your league. That's always been my feeling about it. Why don't you hit me with your best shot? And that's always how I've looked at it as well. I mean, our high school band played this song at every football and basketball game I can remember. It was absolutely a confident song. It's the first Pat Benatar song that I heard as a kid, and I, I fell in love with her voice and definitely fell in love with her persona. She, she rocked. She rocked as hard as anyone in the industry. Hit Me With Your Best Shot was released as the second single from Crimes of Passion. It reached number nine on the Hot 100. It went to number seven on the Cashbox chart. It was actually Pat's first top 10 hit. Certainly not her last. Internationally, Hit Me With Your Best Shot went to number 33 in Australia and it also went to number 10 in Canada. Since then, Hit Me With Your Best Shot has appeared in a lot of movies and TV shows, including Miami Vice. Edwin Moses, look out! Doogie Howser, MD, Shrek Forever After, ER, King of the Hill, 90210, regular show. It's always sunny in Philadelphia, The Vampire Diaries, Community, Family Guy. Fire away. Supergirl, Glee, Rock of Ages, The Goldbergs. Uh, the list is endless. Hit Me With Your Best Shot has also been covered by Kelly Clarkson. Delilah Bright on One For The Money, Minnie McCready, uh, Rascal Flatts, Brandi Carlisle did it as well. Kelly Osbourne did it on The Masked Singer. And Martina McBride has teamed up with Pat Benatar to sing it as well. Although Hit Me With Your Best Shot and Crimes of Passion would give Benatar a multi-platinum breakthrough, she would later say, it was just a bunch of material that didn't work for me and I wasn't happy with it. People always say it's my best album and I'm thinking to myself, you don't know how good I could have sung on that record. Even though Pat knew how pivotal it was to her career, budding career, she would quickly outgrow the song and would joke about how much she hated singing it. There's that, and you know, it's not exactly easy to sing your real tough cookie with a straight face. I'll give her that. Ultimately, Pat Benatar wanted to have a bigger say in the songwriting of her music. She grew to be very meticulous about lyrics because she was the one that had to sing them. I get that. You're real tough cookie with a long history. Well, and finally, just last year to be exact, Pat Benatar retired Hit Me With Your Best Shot for good from her life sets. And though she may have been sick of singing it anyway, uh, the primary reason for cutting the track was to make a social statement. Pat Benatar deemed the lyrics to be in poor taste, considering uh, the rise of mass shootings in the U.S. 
is what she said. Said Pat about it, we have what we call the Holy 14. You know, songs that if we don't play them, you'll give us a hard time. And we're not doing Hit Me With Your Best Shot, and fans are having a heart attack. And I'm like, I'm sorry. In deference to the victims of the families of these mass shootings, I'm not singing it. I tell them, if you want to hear the song, go home and listen to it. The title is tongue-in-cheek, but you have to draw the line. I can't say those words out loud with a smile on my face. I just can't. I'm not going to go on stage and soapbox. I go to my legislators, but that's my small contribution to protesting. I'm not going to sing it. Tough. I mean, agree with that or not, we can at least listen to the song on our own. Uh, maybe even let it take us back to a simpler time, back to the golden era of rock when songs like Hit Me With Your Best Shot ruled the charts and the world was a little more sane than it is now. It is what it is. I love this song and it will always take me back to a time in the early 80s when my dad took me to high school football and basketball games. He was the play-by-play -play announcer and the school band would play it. And you know, it would boost the team's spirit and the crowd would be singing along cheering the home team on, like I said, simpler time. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Pat Benatar and hit me with your best shot. What do you remember about the song? What do you think about her not performing it anymore? What do you think about how it came together in the New Age Pillow Fight? Pretty awesome. Uh, if you dig our content, make sure to subscribe below so you never miss out on our videos. We'd love to have you as part of this community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.